When IVF doesn't work, most women walk away with the same explanation. It's your eggs. It's your age. It's the sperm quality. It just happens. For me, it was always, I don't know. And that's where the story ends. But what if I told you that's only one version of the story? And what if there's a version you may not have thought about or heard of before? And it's the one where you could actually have more control to change things and make it better. So this episode is all about taking the blinders off. We're not going to point fingers at anyone. This is not a blame game, but to open up your eyes to everything that might impact your IVF results. Because when we're only given the things we can't control, like your age, right? We stop looking for things that we can control. So I'm going to talk you through Maybe again, maybe it's things you just haven't thought about or just the lesser known, lesser talked about reasons why IVF can fail. The ones that don't tend to be a part of the conversation that you can now make a part of the conversation. Because when you know more, then you get to have better conversations with your doctor. And I always say, if you ask better questions, you get better answers. So let's give your next cycle a better shot at working by finally understanding the things that no one has explained until now. Okay, so I just put together a list of the things that I hear all the time my clients are telling me why they were told their egg retrievals failed. And the list is, you're old, your weight might be a factor, it's probably your egg quality, it's the sperm, you're a poor responder, there were no eggs in the follicles, The embryos didn't make it. We don't know why. It's your PCOS, it's your AMH, or sometimes this just happens. All right, let's pause right there. Yes, some of these might be factors, but notice how a lot of them just aren't in your control and they all sound like your fault. Well, here's the thing. Instead of ending with a sentence, like it's your age, period, what if we started changing conversation a little bit and we end with comma and. So it's your age gives you nothing but really a shame storm about starting too late or taking too long or all the things that, that we've, you know, tell ourselves. And what if it's, yes, I am older trying to have a baby, comma, and I want to know if there are other protocols that can work, right? Just the comma and is gonna open up new questions, new options, and new strategies. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so I now put my list together of the things that could go wrong with an egg retrieval and then a transfer. So these are the things that could get in the way of you having a successful round of IVF. Wrong priming medications, wrong timing or length of the priming medications, wrong start date for the stimulation drugs, wrong stimulation meds entirely, wrong dose, either too high or too low, or the right dose to start, but then they needed to be adjusted and they weren't, trigger shot mistakes like the wrong medication, the wrong time, or we missed monitoring appointments and we kind of missed the key day for it. Eggs are overstimulated. Eggs are overcooked, too big. And then of course, there's the things that are happening in the lab. Of course, there's human error, poor egg handling, the wrong way of doing fertilization, the wrong timing for fertilization. Yes, there is a timing that you need to go by for fertilization. And more about the lab, there could be really outdated equipment that's just not gonna work as well as more updated equipment, right? The embryologists are not doing things that they typically do. I think that would go back to probably human error. The culture or the medium that the embryos are growing in isn't what it's supposed to be. Like one time there was a big outage of the medium that everyone uses and you had to use different medium and it wasn't working as well. Also how the embryos are handled, you know, too much and not enough. These are all real and these are all mostly fixable and that's the good news. So here is the list that I often hear from my clients and what I heard for, you know, eight out of 10 transfers in terms of why transfers don't work. The embryo must have been abnormal. You know, even when embryos are tested and they come back normal. I've heard doctors say, but testing isn't perfect, so you never know, right? I've often heard of miscarriages being explained as bad luck. And again, with the transfer, I often hear, don't forget how old you are. Okay, yes, and. 
All right, here is where we're at. Yes, and here are some of the things that you can discuss with your doctor that could get in the way of a successful transfer. Let's start with the uterine lining. Do we know for sure there is no inflammation, infection, scar tissue, hydrocell pinks, any of those? Do we know outside of the uterus, is there possibly endometriosis that could be impacting uh, implantation? Also, the wrong timing for the transfer, the protocol not adjusted to your body and your hormone response. And I'm really particular about progesterone. I just feel like it needs to be tracked a little bit more carefully. So did you get enough progesterone? How did you know? Was it tracked? Are your levels showing that you have enough, right? Do you need suppositories and injections or just injections, right? Like these are all things that could absolutely impact you getting or staying pregnant. Also, I was just talking to a client and I let her know how I prep somebody for transfers. Part of it is if you've already had a pregnancy loss, I assume you're prone to pregnancy losses, right? Because that can only help. That can't hurt. I think it can hurt when you've had a pregnancy loss and it's assumed that it's just bad luck. Because if it happens again and we find out the embryo is normal, oh, that is such a missed opportunity. But if you assume you're prone to pregnancy losses or do the things or tests that could tell you whether you're prone to pregnancy losses or not, and not just the few tests that doctors run, I find those very limiting, but that's where we can really open up the doors to, okay, we've had this happen before. We don't want to have this happen again. Let's talk to the doctors about the things that we can put in place so that another pregnancy loss is a lot less likely to happen if the embryo is supposed to stick and stay. Okay, so... How do you have these conversations with your doctor? Again, yes, and we agree with what they are saying because absolutely that is a possibility as well. And we want to open up the conversation to other strategies, plans, and suggestions. So yes, I know I'm basically the oldest woman in history trying to have a baby. That's a joke, of course. And I see on my monitoring report that my follicles grew unevenly. Can we talk about some strategies to maybe fix that? Okay, I know my AMH is low, and I also see that a few follicles grew really quickly with the stimulation medication. Is there anything we can do to help prevent those lead follicles from jumping forward without suppressing me so much, because they might suggest really suppressive priming medication, without suppressing my ovaries so much, because we don't want to put them in a coma? Yes, I get that we are doing what we can with my current state, my embryos, my age, my whatever. And we've tried this approach twice now and it hasn't worked. What other approaches have you seen work with patients like me? Okay, and the last one, I know the embryos might have been abnormal even though they were tested. And what else can we do to make sure that there is nothing in the uterus that is going to block implantation. Can we check for infection? Can we check for scar tissue? What would you recommend? I am hoping that when you ask very specific questions, you're going to get more specific answers and strategies. And here's the thing. If your doctor's answer is, I'm at a loss. Like, I don't know what to do next. I love that. I love that honesty. I have so much respect for doctors that know they are out of ideas because usually they're open to listening to what you have to say, right? They're opening up their own blinders and I have so much respect for that. Okay, I know all of this can be so overwhelming, what to ask, you know, how to bring up questions for the doctor. You're asking questions, you don't even know if what's coming back is what should be coming back. I get it. But use things like your monitoring reports for your egg retrieval to try to look for clues as to what could have happened. A lot of follicles that didn't grow, right? We talked about uneven follicles, lead follicles growing really quickly. Wherever you can, look for a roadmap to help you create better conversations with your doctor. And of course, if you need someone to help you read the map, write the questions, analyze the answers, give you all the suggestions to discuss with your doctor so that you are on the right track and there's nothing you need to know or do, I'm here for you, mama. And if we have never spoke before, oh my gosh, go to the show notes, go on my website and let's book a quick call together. I'd love to hear about you, what you're doing, what you need and help you get to where you want to be. Not doing more IVF, not trying to figure out questions for the doctor, but holding your beautiful baby. 
And one more thing before we go, it would mean the world to me if you took 60 seconds and reviewed this podcast, letting me know if this is helping, how it's helping. I get so many DMs talking about thanking me for the pregnancy because of this podcast. You have no idea what that does. I was just with my daughter, round 10, yesterday, and we got another one. And of course, I was in tears. And of course, she rolled my eyes telling me how much I cry. And I do. And I'm proud of that. Anyway, if you are getting a lot out of this podcast, I would love for you to take the time to give a written review. It's the way that more people can find this podcast and get access to this free advice on how to make their IVF end as quickly as possible and have them hold their baby as soon as possible. Well, that was our uncovering for the day. If you have a feeling that your IVF protocols or strategies could use a second opinion, start with our website, TashaBlasi.com, for resources and even a free discovery call where we can learn about your specific IVF needs and see how we can help.